Jesse, cue it up. Everybody in their places. It's time to go. Are we rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. Okay, let's get it done, everybody. Let's go, let's go. Hey, How's my hair? Is it okay? No, 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 no. Poxy, they can't see you. All right, come on. Let's go. It's dudes, people. Poxy, start on page four. Get the Here lines right this time. Right, Five, I got it this time. I swear. Four, three, come on. Come on. Welcome back to the Ghosts of Hollywood. I'm Poxy Leonard here with Miss Reagan, and tonight we are extremely glad you could join us for the show because it is the season two finale, baby. Yep. What's wrong, Reagan? I just figured I'd picked up a better gig by now, you know? Well, what do you mean? You've already made it to the top. Then this mountain is a petite one, my friend. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll fire you at the end of the show. Sound good? <laughs> the producers will probably have fired you at the end of the show. Won't be the first time, but you can't kill what you can't control. Are you sure about that? Well, <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe we should get on with the show. All right, so I'm very excited to announce our special guest tonight here on The Ghost of Hollywood, and that is none other than the musical icon and actress Miss Kitty Lester. Having just celebrated her 88th birthday, Miss Lester has agreed to take a little time to speak with Reagan and I tonight about the story of her life and working career in New York and Hollywood. And hopefully we can uncover some interesting new information on her roles in movies like Uptight and Blackula, or her work acting on television as Hesser Sue in Little House, or Rita in the television show Julia. Especially Little House, because she had such a significant role in the show for a long time. And her backstory with Michael Landon. More on that later. But it is really heartening. You know, as a fan, I've always viewed Michael Landon in a positive light, and I'm glad she provides insight into his person through her experience in working with him. You're so warm in conversation tonight, Poxy. Oh, hey, now don't call me out. Things are going just fine. My level of electric elution is on par, yeah? You mean elocution? What'd I say? Never mind, Poxy. Now, I know that her role in Uptight was supporting, but the overall experience provided by that movie is incredible. I know that in today's world, Uptight has largely fallen into obscurity, but the impact that it had on its audience during the time of its release is incredible. Now, Uptight was revisioned from John Ford's 1935 film, The Informer, which itself was based on an Irish short story by Liam O'Flaherty. And Uptight is a story about black revolutionaries set in the backdrop of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. So it leaves nothing behind throughout the entire film. I mean, I can't ruin it for you here. So if you haven't seen it, go dig up the movie Uptight from 1968. You won't regret it. Anyway, aside from Uptight, Miss Ketty would perform as Juanita in the movie Blackula. In that movie, Miss Ketty runs afoul with Blackula after she hits him with her cabbie, and then has a little vampiric scent of her own before the end comes for her. Of all things, and one topic we may not discuss at length here is Miss Ketty's major hit song, Love Letters, which was a critical success upon its release in 1962. I mean, I'm sure it'll come up, but we're crazy movie people, so... That's kind of our directive tonight, not not the, not the musical career so much. There's plenty of information about the history of her music career available, and Miss Ketty even performed recently to commemorate the 60th anniversary of Love Letters. Now, more information, so before we get into the interview, it is important that I clarify a few things for context, you know, before we start talking with Miss Ketty, as I said. More recently, as part of her autobiography, Miss Ketty has discussed a relationship that took place during her early years singing and acting in New York. Now, this relationship was significant to her, and the man she may or may not discuss is named Carlo Bellotti. Although an immigrant himself, Carlo being white identifying placed constraints on the relationship he and Miss Ketty had due to anti-miscegenation laws in place during that era, not to mention a largely negative outward public attitude toward interracial relationships. So, Miss Ketty and Carlos wouldn't stay together and ultimately went on to lead separate lives in other relationships. But, it is going to probably come up in conversation tonight, and just to put it in context for you so that you understand, if you haven't read her book or aren't already familiar with this story. Their story is definitely one of its own inside of the larger interest readers may take in her life when reading the book. That's true. Alright, wall crawlers, let's take a quick break here before we bring our friend, the incredible Miss Kitty Lester, on the air. I'm Poxy Leonard here with Miss Reagan, and you are listening to the worst in cult, trash, and cinema. This is The Ghost of Hollywood. Can't get enough of The Ghost of Hollywood? Check out our entire first season, now streaming wherever you choose to listen to your podcast. And don't forget to like and subscribe. While you're at it, check out our website at theghostofhollywood.com so that we can keep you up to date on all the latest with The Ghost of Hollywood. 
Welcome back to the Ghost of Hollywood. I'm Poxy Leonard here with Miss Reagan, and we are speaking with none other than the legendary Miss Ketty Lester. Well known for her 1962 hit, Love Letters, and her role as Hester Sue on Little House on the Prairie, Ketty has also appeared in films such as Blackula, Uptight, and Uptown Saturday Night, just to name a few. She worked on Days of Our Lives, Julia, and has made various television and commercial appearances through the 1960s and 70s. In the 1980s, Ketty would release another album, I Saw Love. Currently, Miss Ketty Lester is set to appear in Hollywood on August 14th, just a few days shy of her birthday. She also recently has written an autobiography about her life, which is made available now at her website. All of that said, I'd like to wish you an early happy birthday, Miss Lester, and thank you for joining us on the show. Well, I thank you so much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good for my birthday to try... And my 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 manager just insist, insists on me trying to sing again. But I have had diseases, and I am not a well person. And of course, my voice is not the clear, strong voice that it used to be. But we will do whatever is God's will. All right. Well, are you are you <laughs> excited to be performing again? It's scary, a little, but it, I think it would be interesting for me. I haven't done it in over, I think, 60 years, or maybe 50 years. So it would be something new for me. All right. Well, let's get started. I'm going to take it back for a little bit here with the old classic. I know you've been asked this question many times, so I'm going to try and put it in the right, right tense this way. Now, while performing at the Hollywood Purple Onion Club in the 1950s, you would befriend the comedic legend Groucho Marx, who was a frequent attendant at that time. This would eventually lead to your first television appearance during a 1957 episode of Groucho's infamous quiz show, You Bet Your Life. Now, revisiting that, what can you recall about your first time being on television? And I know your family is very important to you. Were they able to watch it that? No, my family wasn't able to watch it because basically I'm not sure whether we had a television, had a television or not. I lived at the time with my sister Ernestine and my brother Frank, and they were working all day, so they wouldn't be able to watch it because they were at home, but when Groucho said, you want to be on television, I didn't really know what television was, <laughs> and he had been to the Purple Onion so many times, I said, well, I don't care, I always <laughs> said that, I don't care, I'll do what he's saying, I'll do that, if he's talking, I can talk, because so, <laughs> we went on, and uh that was my first time. I think I did three of them. And he was always coming to the club. So he was like a friend to me. And I was very grateful to have him as a friend. And you appear, you appeared on the show then as Revoida. You were still going by the name Revoida Frierson at that time, correct? Well, that's my legal name, Revoida Frierson. And, of course, it was changed, I changed the Revoida when I started working, in, when I went to San Francisco, because Revoida is a difficult name to pronounce. And every time you say, if, when somebody asks you, what is your name, and you say Revoida, the next line is what? <laughs> in other words, what did you say? Well, you got to spell it. It's spelled exactly the way it's pronounced. R E V V O Y Boy D A D A R E V O Y D A. Maybe your brothers. Your brothers had a nickname for you, though, didn't they? How was it in the book? It, it and was... my brothers. I had two names when I was a child. My sisters would always call me Void, and my brothers would just say Revy. 
Revy. That's what it was. So I knew well, it was a boy or a girl by the name they called me. It was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my mother had named me when I was born. I was the last of the 15 children. So when my mother named me, she'd sort of run out of names, and she named me Java. But we had a teacher, and that teacher, I'm sure you read it in the book, she said, you can't name that child that. Yes. And my mother said, well, yes, I can, because I'm not going to change it. If anybody else says it, you're gonna to have to do it. And that teacher went to the went to town, changed my name, and made it Revolta. Revolta was much harder than Ojava, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, she named me Revolta. The lady said, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> Even the woman at the birth certificate place. Why are you changing it to that? Well, then, but she did it. Well, you met. You were talking to some young boy while you were at school, though, right? And that's when that's when you changed it to Keddie. Yeah. Really? Well, I changed it. I said when we went to California. Now, in in hope, everybody knew me as Rivada, and they would just call me Vora, just like my sisters and brothers. But, and I had gotten a scholarship at Philander Smith College because I was singing and acting in hope. Every time we had a show, if I wasn't going to be on, it wasn't going to be no show. <laughs> so it was just, I was famous down there with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it started. That's where it started. <laughs> and I got the scholarship, but my sister Maddie and I finished in the same class. Now, Maddie was older than I am, but she was always right behind me. Everywhere I go, I had to take care of Maddie. And my mother would always tell me, watch out to Maddie. <laughs> All right. I'm going to Philander Smith. Where is Maddie going? And I said, well, maybe we should go to the service like my brother Hayward and Cottrell. Well, my mother said, no, I got to write Hayward and find out what he said. She wrote him, and he wrote her back and says, no, they ain't going to the service. You keep them there until I was get off of work, and I'll come and get them. Well, he came and got us, and he took us to San Francisco, where we would live with my brother, Cottrell. That's where we started going to school. When I went to the school, of all people, now, I ain't never been no boy or girl. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I never liked the boys. <laughs> Me and the boys never did get along. Yeah, but they, a couple but, of them chased you, though, when I was reading in that book. A couple of them was giving you a wild time out there. Yeah, well, uh, I got a few when I got older. Yeah. And this one come to me instead of going to Maddie. He came to me. He says, this is this your first time? In, in going to the college? I say, yeah. Are you happy? I say, no. <laughs> 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 and then he said, what was my name? And then naturally, I told him, Revoida. And he said, what? I said, listen, just call me Kitty, K-E-T-T-Y. And I was thinking about a cat, but I forgot how to spell the cat. So, you know. <laughs> Came out cat. <laughs> it just ended up being Kitty, and I spelled K-E-T-T-Y, and that was Kitty. 
That's, that's where that is and name too. That's destiny, though. You know that that E is destiny. You were supposed to. It was supposed yes. to be Kitty the whole time. I think so. And I, even though I forgot how to say a cat, uh, it wouldn't have been good to say Kitty, and so I just said Kitty. Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, just call me Kitty. And I said, come on, Matt. And I tell him, Matt, come on and let's go to the, to the building and, and everything. But that's when that was changed. changed. And, of course, in San Francisco, I worked as Kitty Frierson, which was my legal made your name, mm-hmm. but when I met, came to Los Angeles and opened at the Purple Onion down here, when I first started, I was going as Kitty Frierson. But when I left the Purple Onion, when it closed, I started working at a club in Beverly Hills. And it was the Yee Little Club All right. in Beverly Hills. And that's where I met all of these. There were the white stars, so like Rosemary Clooney and all of them. And I met Dorothy Shea. And Dorothy Shea was the one that said, Frierson is too long for show business. You need to change it. I said, well, I don't know what I could change it to. And she, I, because I said, that's my maiden name. That's my father's name. They said, well, we are going to change it. And what if we called it? And she thought a little bit. She said, what if we call it Lester? Well, it was short. And I, I said, well, I don't care. Uh, but I went to my brother and sister, and I said, she wants to call me Lester instead of Frierson. And my sister Ernestine said, well, it's a shorter name. Maybe she knows best. And my brother Frank said, well, you're going to be, always be Rivera to me, and you're going, always going to be VB, and you're always going to be twice. And so <laughs> he didn't care. He said, you can change it to what you want to, but to me, it's going to always be Frank. <laughs> and that was my brother Frank. But we did change it to Lester. Well, you would go on to perform various times on National Bandstand, The Regis Philbin Show, and Hollywood A Go-Go, just to name a few of them. When it was all new, yes. what did you enjoy the most about performing in front of the camera as a singer? It was new for me, but Dorothy always told me, just be yourself. Just be natural. And of course, when Groucho was on there, Groucho was himself, and I would just be myself. He was funny, so I would just be a little funny. I'd be just like him. I would do it just like him. So it was just a natural thing for me. And they were flirting with you on You Bet Your Life. There was another man on there, and they were like flirting with you, kind of giving you yeah, a hard time. They, since I said, I told Groucho, I said, now, you know, I don't know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed about it. He said, well, I'm going to get you a partner. So he had a man on there that uh, was a, from California, and we went on together. And uh, sometimes he would ask, I said, you know, I don't know that. <laughs> I would, he would always ask me a question. That I didn't know. I said, you know, I don't know that. And the man would know some of them. He would answer. He said, well, you got it right. (laughs) (laughs) As long as he said I got it right, that was all right with me because I know he was going to play me anyway. (laughs) It didn't make no difference to me. It was just fun. Now, 
<laughs> what, but what about when you were singing? How was it when was did you feel pressure from singing on the air, or was that different? How was it like because singing on television back then was kind of a different game than it would be now, you know, with the microphones and everything. Yes, it had the microphones, but I had used the microphones from the Purple Onion in San Francisco, and that's where I met my first show business friend. That was Maya Angelo. She was uh, my friend back in those days, and she would always tell me what to do. She always knew what to do and would tell me what to do and introduce me to different people. She knew I was from the country, and she knew I was from the same place she was from, but she was telling everybody she was from Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs> and she was making I up songs. She was from she, she had me food too. And she was the way she dressed, I loved the way my head would dress. And one day I said, I've got to meet this woman. She's from a different country. And I <laughs> went into her dressing room. I knocked on the door. I said, Miss, Miss uh Maya, I said, Miss Angelo. I said, I've got to meet you. It's so nice to meet somebody from a foreign country. And she started laughing at me. And I said, are you laughing at me? (laughs) 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 She says, Kelly, I'm from the same state you're from. I said, no, you're from Jamaica. You sing the Jamaican song. And... She said, do you know what cloud is? I said, wait a minute. I said, uh, cloud where? <laughs> I knew where cloud was. Yeah. Cloud was where my father and I used to go to get our cornmeal ground to make cornmeals, to make cornbread. All right. That was a place where you always took your your things to be ground and to be sold. Even we took the cotton there. But they didn't have no school. It was just a little old country town where they had all these meals and things where you could take and get your cornmeal made into meal and your 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 cotton. They brought the cotton and all of that. They did that. Well, that's what you picked and on, I Maya, said, didn't you? You told her, you said, at least we have a yes, high school where I'm I from. At least we have her, a high school. <laughs> yes, I told her, you can't be from Carl. I said, Carl ain't got no railroad. But you know, <laughs> in hope, we had a railroad, and we got a railroad station and everything. And uh, that now is Clinton's. They have a, a little uh, c- a place where they uh, have pictures of Clinton, and they have a picture of me. They're in hope oh, that's... that it was the railroad station. And and the fact that she was from Camden, and I'm from Hope, and I was saying that when she said she was from Camden, I said, Camden ain't got no railroad station. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why we wouldn't go to get our cornmeal made. And stuff like that, I said, you can't, but I, I said, you, you can't tell me that. You can't make no joke out of me, joke with me like that. <laughs> <laughs> we were all just, we started, we became friends from then on. And I would tell her, you have a, a, your goal to be fooling these people that you're from Jamaica. You know. Yeah. And I said, one time I asked her, I said, I wanted, I told her, I wanted to learn some of the Jamaican songs. And I said, where do you get the Jamaican songs from? 
She said, I messed them up. I said, go along. <laughs> <laughs> well, Phyllis Diller came to the, new, to the new club in San Francisco the same night that I came on. Well, you know, we didn't have women comics back in those days. Phyllis was one of the first. Yeah. But when she first got on there, she wasn't very funny. <laughs> That's what you said. She just, everybody said she just looked funny. She wasn't funny, but she, <laughs> she looked just funny. She was ugly. <laughs> 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 and I told her one night when she got ready, to, I was the first act, Phyllis was the second act, and Maya was the star. And uh, I love the way my dress, because she wore those tight new pants that people wear today. Yeah. She was wearing them back in those days. And she would wear those pants. And she would wear a long dress cut all the way up to the hip. And she didn't wear no shoes. And I thought, and she would do that little dance that she would do with her songs. Well, I thought that was pretty. And uh, so that's why I had to introduce myself to the woman from Jamaica. (laughs) (laughs) Then we became good friends. And when all of a sudden, after everything happened with the baby, uh, my sister's baby, I uh, was taking care of her. And we had worked together, the three of us had worked together for about a year. And then the people said they were going to buy a new club. They were going to buy it down here in in Los Angeles. And they wanted me to be the act there. I said, I don't think I'm uh, experienced enough to be a star of a new club. But when you did, you went down there, they got rid of the comedy act, didn't they? And it was just, it ended up just being they singing. They got rid of the, there was my quit singing, trying to sing, and she started writing. Yeah. And it was just me. And that's where I met Groucho Marx and all of them. I was in the club by myself with a trio, and we would do the shows. And Maya, for some reason, came to Los Angeles where I was. But she was writing at that time. She was writing poems. When did you, I remember, so, so at some point when you went with Dorothy Shea to New York for Days of Our Lives, right? You, Maya, was ups, Maya was upset about that, though, wasn't she? Wasn't Maya upset about that? Maya got upset. When when I quit, when I closed at the Purple Onion, when the Purple Onion down here closed, they put me at the G Little Club in San, in Beverly Hills. Yeah. That's where I met Dorothy Shea. Dorothy Shea signed a contract that she wanted me to be her protege. I mean, she was, you know, and she was going to help me and all of that kind of stuff. She introduced me to Lena Horn. And uh, I had already met Summer Davis Jr. through Maya. Yeah. But Maya was down here. And uh, Dorothy wanted to take me to New, to New York to try to uh, uh, get me into the record business. And... Uh, when I told Ernestine and my brother, Frank, they said, well, go ahead. It ain't costing me nothing. But when I told Maya, Maya said no. And I said, Maya, why are you, why are you saying that? She said, I don't want you to go to New York with Dorothy. And I didn't understand what she was being so stubborn about. And I I said, but why? 
And she said, she looked to me. I said, Maya, I said, I love you too, but you are my big sister. You know, in other words, I considered Matt my big sister, but Maya is bisexual. Yeah. And I didn't know it. Uh-huh. I didn't know nothing about that. And I said, it's not what you said, it's the way you said it. I said, I don't, if you are my sister, my big sister, and I said, I love you too, but you are not trying to help me. She, then she said, all right, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You go to to New York with Georgia. And I said, I'll call you as soon as I get back. And I'll tell you what happened and everything. But, you know, I didn't understand what she was talking about or what she was. I, did, I just didn't understand the situation. I was country, from the country, from a big family. Didn't know nothing. And I didn't know what she was talking about. And New, that would be a big change for you because <clears throat> New York would bring you into, uh, you know, the first time you would be in television, right? Like as acting in television, correct? Not like... Um... Well, the thing of it is, no, what Dorothy took me to, to uh, New York for was to have me audition to be in the record business. But Rosemary Clooney, I had met Rosemary Clooney right there at the U.U. Club in Beverly Hills. And Rosemary Clooney had told me, if you get in the record business, and she said, you will, don't ever go to a company called RCA Victor. Mm. She said, they'll either make you or break you. But that would come around in time. You ended up not signing with them, but later on you kind of got in a weird contract situation with them, like years later, didn't you? Yes. The thing of it is, when I went there, that's the first place Dorothy took me to, RCA Victor. I did the audition, and RCA Victor told me I didn't have a recording voice. I said, good. I said, because... (laughs) And I told Dorothy, I said, I'm glad they said that because if they had said something else, I would have had to say no because I don't believe in in R.C. Yeah. And it was just one of those things. I don't like R.C. So when they said that, I decided I wouldn't be in the record business. I would just, you know, audition for them, and that would be that. Yeah. But I met Dorothy, and they liked me for some reason. So I became a recording artist. With them, or somehow we managed to get together. But I, I, I didn't believe in RCA Victor. I never did have faith in RCA Victor. I was just a recording artist. And since they didn't like me, that was fine. I didn't like them, and that was fine. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those silly things. And I accepted them the way they were. But as we were going along, we ca- I came back to, uh, to uh, Los Angeles, and I met the Everly Brothers. Yeah, so you toured with them, didn't you? You were with toured with them on the road for toured a while. Toured with them. And Phil, Phil played guitar for you, didn't he? Didn't he play guitar for you, too? Yeah, one of the Everly Brothers played the guitar for me when I went to uh, 
London. They sent me to London. And the first time I went to London, I was with uh, the Everly Brothers. But when I went the second time, I went by myself. And I was with, I was, I was by myself. I was where the, the, uh, Beatles sang. Oh, yeah. I you went were, to that. Yeah, because you were talking, I remember in the book, you were talking about, um, like the cafes being really, like the coffee cafes and the milk shops being popular. And the Beatles were placed somewhere, but they had to go up the block to a bar, you were saying. In right. the book. Yeah. But it was the Beatles that became, Famous, and when I came home, they had sold my records to the to the the Beatles. So here I am singing to the Beatles. <laughs> Is that pretty wild? I got singing to the Beatles, and the next next thing I know, I was back here. At the D Little Club, and Dorothy went on a on one of her shows, and here come the Beatles in. They asked me to make a tape for them. It was all right, so I made the tape for them. All right. And they just told me to make all the songs I knew, and I did. But when the songs came out, they the the Beatles was the head of the show. It wasn't me. It was the Beatles at 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 one of the at the club there in in L. A. Mm-hmm. But I worked at the club until this. These, these, this, uh, this group decided they wanted me to make tapes, a tape for them at the D Little Club. I went to the, this man's house, made the tapes for him, and they just kept it. One more, one more, oh, one more. All right, I'm singing, and I'm singing all the songs that I know. I said, listen. I'm tired, and I got to go to work tonight. I said, I don't know no more songs. But Lincoln had, had the song that became a hit. I said, I had sang all the songs I knew, and I had told them, I am tired, and I've got to go to work tonight. I am not singing no more song. I said, you can play that and I will sing it for you. I said, then I'm going home. He played it, but he played it so straight. It didn't have no feeling to it. I said, man, don't you know how to play a song with a little soul? Yeah. A little feeling. He didn't know what soul was. Lincoln was a classical musician, and he was a heck of a good one. I mean, he was a great musician. He could write all of that stuff out, but I'm talking about class, he did Mozart and all that kind of stuff. All right, when I told him, play it with a little soul. And he didn't know what so was. I said, well, it's the form of gospel, man. And he said, well, what is that? He didn't even know what gospel was. <laughs> and I said, man, I'm going to have to show you with my boy. But I had a black drummer, Earl Palmer. Yeah. Was the drummer that always played with me on most of my records. And I said, Earl, as I'm giving him these things, you get the beat and have Lincoln come in there with it. And we're going to put some souls in this song and I'm going to sing it. And I said, then 
I'm going home. Well, I gave him the introduction. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, I said, get with it. Uh, uh, uh. Bless But I just kept right on with that soul beat. And, of course, Earl had it come on Lincoln. Get with it. Get with it. And he got Lincoln to play in gospel. We did that thing. And I did love letters with the first gospel background on the pop song. And it stuck like glue, didn't it? And it was there. Yeah. But you see, the thing of it is, I had a double hit because when I did, I'm a fool to want you. It was, uh, they played that on the jazz stations. Yeah. So it was a double it was a double hit. It was on the jazz stations. And it was on the rock and roll because it had that gospel feeling to it. Yeah, but and, at the time, I mean, it's almost in ways like a classic rock and roll hit in some ways too. You know what I mean? Like, like yes, it yeah. was. It was like a rock and roll, and of course. Or everybody started doing it then. Do you remember? Do you remember if like any of the classic DJs were playing it, like Alan Freed or if Wolfman Jack were playing it? Do you remember when it was playing on the radio? I mean, you were playing on Regis Philbin the and on one Hollywood that Go Go. Played it most of the time here, and I can't remember his name, but he was at that uh, CBS station on Sunset near the freeway, and that man would play that record all the time. He was a white man. I can't remember his name, but he was very devoted to that record. And uh, another group that was devoted to me was Boston. Boston? You talking Boston, about the, the 70s rock band? For some reason, just loved Teddy Lester. Uh, are you are you talking about the the like the radio stations in Boston or the band Boston? The radio stations in Boston. That's what I thought. I'll say the band when Boston came later. When it came out, when that record came out, it was first a hit in Boston. All right, now I'm understanding. Boston, Massachusetts, and when I went, I was in in. Uh, up in uh, sometime Washington or Oregon, and when I came back to my home base, the G Little Club, here come Lincoln with a big grin on his face, saying, "Your record is number is a hit in Boston." I said, "He made the record for you. I made a tape, some tape." I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "Have you?" Have you met, have you seen Ed? I said, no, I haven't seen Ed, and it's time for my show. I'm fixing to go do my show. So I went on and did my show for the night. When I came to finish my show, here come Ed in with a big grin on his face. Talking about, your record is a hit. I said, what are you talking about? I said, you can't do that to me because I got a manager, Dorothy Shea. Did you tell her about it before you put it on a record? I said, you just doing that to me without even asking me? I didn't even know the company name. I didn't know nothing. When did you learn it was Era Records? He finally told me, he said, well, uh, uh, we, I know we made this, but Error, a company, a little company called Error, wanted it, and they wanted it right away, and we let them have it. I said, you can't do that. I said, you ought to at least let me ask me, or let me know who I'm working for. I don't know that song. I said, I did that song one time. 
Well, you didn't. You didn't even know you won. Like you were nominated for a Grammy. I mean, I know Ella Fitzgerald ended up winning the Grammy, but you didn't even know you were nominated for a Grammy for like forty some years until forty years or so later, did you? I didn't know nothing about no Grammys. <laughs> I, I hadn't heard of Grammys. I didn't know nothing about Grammys, and nobody told me about no Grammys. And when I went to the first club I worked for. Dorothy Shea took me to the club in New York. It was the Village Vanguard. All right. It was a jazz club. He wrote a copy of that, and he was with me, and we would do the song because it was getting on up there. It was number 32 in Boston, and as they would push it, it would just go up and up and up and <laughs> up. And I didn't know what they were doing. Dorothy took me to New York. She got me in the village Vanguard, but then Dorothy got a, a, a show. She was, she, she left me in New York by myself. Yeah, but you, you said she took your bell bottoms idea. I was reading well, about I, the pants. When I went to New York the first time, I saw how the people dressed. Yeah. They were fine dressing people on Broadway. And I said, before I go back, I said, I'm going to make me a special pair of pants. I did a lot of sewing back there. The, the, the picture. My picture on my first album is a gown that I made myself. Yeah, I read that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It's a beautiful dress. Yeah, I made it myself. And George Dr. Shea put the mink pads on the, on the arm. All right. But I made the gown. And I made the first pair of bell bottom pants. I made me a pair of pants. That was when men wore these uh, mohair suits. Yeah. Suit made of mohair. Well, I could go down here at that time. You could go, they had all kind of of uh, materials. And I went downtown and I got me some black mohair. And I made me a pair of pants. But I made them where when I when I made them, I took the outside seam and I put a spread like thing, and I put one spread on the outside and I put a spread on the inside. Well, that made them look different. Yeah. And when I would walk down the street on Broadway. People would look at me and then turn around and look back. Yeah, they were checking I said, you Why out. Why would you look at me like that? Yeah, they were checking said, you out. Am I that bad off? And she said, No, it's your pants. They are different. <laughs> I said, Well, if they are that different, before I open at the building to get Vanguard, I'm going to have me. A pair of pants made, but they're going to be body pants. And she said, oh, I got somebody that will, can make that for you. She had two designers there. So she took me to one of her designers. I told the designer what I wanted. I said, I want a body pants, but I don't want you to put that gourd in the pants. I want you to just spread the legs yeah. and make a, a, put, put a, a shoulder strap. And I told her exactly, told the, the man that was made, that made it, I told him exactly how I wanted a maid. And I want a maid out of satin. I got pink satin. And I made me a pair of bell black, that wide bottom pants. And when I opened at the business vanguard, 
since people have looked at my pants so well, I said, I'm going to open this show tonight mm -hmm. with these pants so well. <laughs> The newspaper. <laughs> they didn't like your, They didn't like your pants in the newspaper. Is what you said. The <laughs> the, 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 real, the post didn't say nothing bad. They just said I had a great voice. Yeah. And it was that. But that New York Times, that man gave me hell. He said, <laughs> "Cut it left to heck." A great voice, but she could have let left them damn bell bottom overalls. He called them. Yeah, but when they came out, what'd you do though? You home. sent him a letter back though, didn't you? You sent him a letter. I, I back. was him that. I kept that. I said, "How dare you insult me?" <laughs> you know, I kept it. Well, about three or four months later. That man had taken those pants, and it was the cover of Vogue magazine. Mm. He had made a pair of bell-bottom pants, and the satin just like I had done it. And inside, he had made these bell-bottom overalls that became so famous and lasted forever. Huh. But you see, I didn't know nothing about getting, you know, a, a, a pattern to your designs and nothing like that. I just wanted to be different. Let's leave it. I just wanted to be different. Nice. Yeah. So, I don't know whether Dorothy and he took those bell bottom pants and made a lot of money off of it, but they took it, and <laughs> that was it. I, I had lost the, the contract to the bell by the mobile. Wow. Well, let's. It was just one of those things. Let's talk about let's talk about movies in 1968 real quick. You, well, you appeared as Alma in the movie Uptight, set in the background of the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and largely filmed in Cleveland, Ohio. So, what do you remember about working on that movie? Uptight was the first movie that I made that I had a a, a part. I wasn't the star of that show. They gave me a dramatic role in there. Yeah. And now, by doing all of the things that I have done, I have done drama because uptight, I took three lines in uptown, uh, uptight, made it so dramatic that I started crying, and the producer went and put his arms around me. And then what happened? And then the Times, you know, the Times at that time. Yeah, that was right after with, Martin Luther King. All died. of these white shows reviews, but they wasn't going to be a no black show, nothing. Yeah. But they gave me a review in Uptight. She was great. I don't know what it is. What they say? They said, don't forget but Kenny I Lester in Uptight? It was dramatic, and I know I was crying when I did it, and when I almost finished it, I know I was dramatic, and it was like, just like Martin Luther King, when we were down there, it was like five. Yeah, that was, I mean, and that movie was pretty crazy. Like, remember the scenes with Tank in, like, the, the, the mirrors? The mirrors in the fun house? That they do the yes. you know that some of that stuff's pretty crazy, you know. It's like uh it's just well, you know the thing of it is, I was just sitting up there. But you sit up and you you look at things going on and then it's come time to you to speak and you start speaking and you speak. Well, whatever I said, I was so into it by the time it got to me to say it. I was so dramatic until I was crying. Yeah, you know, but no one, no one forgot that movie. I mean, that movie was was had such an impact. You know, I had, I had a friend just recently. I had watched. Uh, you remember the Watermelon Man, the old Martin Van Peebles movie? 
Yeah. I was watching Watermelon Man, and um, and then there was the other one, the spook who sat by the door. Remember that one that was banned by the CIA? <laughs> and, yeah. and my friend Maddie Clark, right, his dad was the director of a movie, Kids, in the 90s. And Maddie told me, he said, Zach, you have got to watch Uptight. If you haven't seen Uptight, you got to watch Uptight. It's the it's one of the coolest of them all. And, and that's when I watched Uptight. And I was like, I have got to find Keddie Lester. And that's how we are here right now. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I, I just remember. I don't remember the stars that was on it, but I know I had a small part, and I know I was sitting on a bench, and when everything was going on, I was just watching, and I was into it, and I was getting into it, and I knew it was coming up to my life where I was supposed to speak, and I was into it. That's awesome. No. I was just almost crying by the time I got into that part. I was so dead into it. And the director, when I finished, he came and he just put my arm and said, he said, it's all right, it's all right. You know, I said, what have I done? And it was managed by my, my, my manager that came from, from, that I came back from Europe with. When I went with Camp Calloway to Europe, that's where I met Camp Calloway. He wanted us to take pictures. That's where I met my girlfriend, June. June, after we took the picture, she said, let's go to the bar down in Harlem. I said, I don't drink. And she said, oh, I know the people that own the bar down there. Well, it was Carlo Bellotti and his brother. Yeah. That's where I met Carlo Bellotti. I went there and... He said, when I first got up, I'm sitting at the bar with June. And when they asked for a drink, I said, a seven up. Mm -hmm. I, and then he said, what's your name? I thought he was going to insult me because I'm drinking at the bar a seven up <laughs> with June. Yeah. So I told him, none of your damn business. <laughs> Everybody start laughing at me. I said, you laugh with me, but you're going to laugh at me. I said, shut up. Oh. I said, you don't be laughing at me. <laughs> I'm fussing and fussing and blessing Carlo out. He said, but you're pretty, you're cute. I said, I am not cute. <laughs> and I said, you don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> anyway, I'm insulting him to death. But for some reason, I said, listen to you, I'm going home. I said, I'll meet you at the station tomorrow, at the airport tomorrow. I said, but I'm going home. This man is making me sick. <laughs> he said, where are you going? I said, it's none of your business because you can't go nowhere. And I said, 
I'm not telling you nothing. Well, I left on out. I got me a cab, and I went back to the YWC where I lived. Yeah. That's what I did. It must have been June that told her, told him, we were going to Italy. Well, he was from Italy. He was from the, he uh, was a part of the royal family, but I didn't know this. I didn't think about that. I, I had never had a boyfriend, and I never understood what he was talking about. I was just a dumb girl. You know, I didn't understand nothing. What were you filming in Italy at the time, or what were you doing in Italy? Do you remember? Were you I was with Cap Calloway. Oh, you were with, that's when you were with that's when you were with Cab Calloway on tour. Okay, all right. That's all right. when I was with Cab Calloway, and June had a trio, a dance trio, that was with Cab Calloway. But June knew and was going with Carlo's brother. I didn't know nothing about that. That was all strange and new to me. But she must have told him, because when we got to Italy, he was at the airport to meet us at Carlo Bellotti. Everybody is laughing, can it got a boyfriend, can it <laughs> <laughs> I said, you shut up. I said, I do not know this man, and I don't have no boyfriend. I said, I am a Nona. <laughs> I said, I'm by myself. Don't be making fun of me with no boy. So it was just one of those silly things. No. I didn't know what I was doing. As a... As years went on, because you and Carlo developed a really serious relationship. You said he was the love of your life. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What was it like at the time? I know that you said that, that a lot of the racial segregation got in your way because of miscegenation laws, anti-miscegenation laws. But you, what was it but also like? Years, what was it also like being... Back in those f- days, you know yourself, back in those days, yeah. black women were not allowed to be with black, but with, with uh, white men, that was against the law. Yeah. I, I couldn't do that, but he was such a nice person, and he was always right there. He says, I'm, I love you, I'm going to take care of you, and he was always there trying to protect me and take care of me. And he says, I'm going to get you out of this. Why? This why is not a place for you. And when he got said, you pack your things. And I said, what do you do? Because, you see, another thing that happened, when we were coming back from Italy, everybody, it was, he had been with us. He met us there at that airport. And he asked us, do you know where you're going to stay? I said, no. <laughs> and he found out, oh, I guess Captain Wilson found out where we were staying. He took June and I to the hotel where we were going to stay. And he got himself a room there. He would take us to breakfast. He would do everything. Well, as long as it was, I was with you, I was satisfied. That was, you know, I was secure. Yeah, yeah. But when we got to New York, and who met me on this ship but Carlo Bellotti again? I'm now by myself on this getting ready on this ship to get off. And here's Carlo. Hi, baby. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you remember when Dr. Martin Luther King passed away? Where you were? I was in Los Angeles. But 
I used to, I went to see Dr. Martin Luther King when he made this famous speech, mm -hmm. I Have a Dream. Carlo gave me uh, the, 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 the money, and it was me by, by myself. And all the other people that was there. And this famous woman that, that would, would, that could sing so well. She sang this song, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Okay. That woman could sing that song like nobody in this world. She had a voice like nobody. I have ever heard. And on that day, she was singing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And Martin Luther King was talking, but it was so deep. She, it, it seemed like she had forgotten about the song. And Martin, uh, this, this, uh, woman said not go tell it on the mountain but I have a dream and this woman started, Martin Luther King started preaching I have a dream the greatest speech in the world now she gave him he thought he was about to quit speaking. Mm -hmm. And Mahalia Jackson said, Not yet, Martin. I have a dream. And he started on that, I have a dream. And everybody, everybody went crazy. Even me. I have a dream, and that has been the greatest speech I've ever heard, and it's been the speech of the century. I have a dream was that day, and my hatred Jackson told him, don't sit down, in other words, until you do that sermon, I have a dream. She had heard him preach it. And she didn't want him to leave that stage until he did. I have a dream. Now, I was with Martin Luther King at a church before he, was, he died. I went down there. And he made another speech that was great. He almost preached his sermon on that night. And it was near, it was the night he was killed. It was this speech where he said something, we are going to make it, or something like that. I may not get there with you, but we will make it to the promised land, he said. I always remember that. We will make it to the promised land. I may not get there with you, but we will make it to the promised land. The promised land is just another speech. I almost cry every time I hear it. I went to the airport. I was coming home, but I had to see him say this, do this sermon. And then I got, somebody took me to the airport. And the next thing I knew, they said Martin Luther King is, has been killed. It was just one of those shocking moments yeah. that I had just heard one of his great, great speeches. He was one of the greatest speakers I'd ever heard. And now he's dead. 
what do you do? How do you take that? I mean, it's just a loss. Now, talking Julia for a minute, <clears throat> what do you remember about performing? What were some of your fondest memories working with Diane Carroll on that show when you played Rita Hopkins? Diane was the sweetest thing. And, you know, by that time, I was a strong epileptic because I had had my son. And when I had my son, I became a grandma. I would have grandma seizures. When I did that show, I had come from Washington, and my son didn't want to come to me. My sister Ernestine would always keep him when I would go out of town. She would keep my son with her son. But when I came back, and I had gone to Oregon, because I had felt pretty good, and the strange thing, I don't remember having a seizure in Oregon. But I used to would have those seizures, and when I would have them, you would feel like you were dying. Then you would have, and I would have them basically in bed at night. I got, uh, I was taking this medicine, and I would take almost four or five pills every day just to keep the medicine. I said, but I'm going to Oregon. I'm going to do this. Show. I went to Oregon for two weeks. I took those pills, and I was taking four and five of those pills a day during that show. I worked it. When I came home, my boy had been with my sister all the time. He didn't know nothing about me, and he didn't want to come to me. All right, I said, I ain't going out of town no more. And I said, I'm going to call my agent and tell him, I ain't going out of town no more. If he can't get me nothing here in town, I won't be working until I get this boy who, who, who let him know who, who, who's, who's, who's the boss here. I saw that. It was just one of those things. But I was with him, and I stayed with him, and then when, when I got where I would remember, I, I, I remember, I didn't remember having any more seizures. And I thought I was all right. I thought I was fine. And I did this show, and it was, uh, what was it called? A Raisin in the Sun. Raisin in the sun, I did that. I played Ruth. I played that with Bill Richards. I played Ruth, and Bill Richards played the mother, and then there was the boy that played the husband. I think my husband. All right. But the Times gave me all the reviews. The Times said I was the greatest, you know. And I said, well, I hope that it did me good here on this show. The next thing I knew is they were saying, asking, that was the first, uh, well, it's the, black, the first black series black that we had called Julia. And then... I was the co they asked came to the they came to the to the, the nightclub. Not the nightclub, but the place where I was doing it. Okay. And they asked me, Do you want to do this show? I said, Of course I do. Why not? As long as it's in town, I'll do it. So when I finished raising in the sun I did, I think it was three episodes of Julia. 
All right, so you appeared as the cabbie Juanita in the cult classic horror movie Blackula, directed by William Crane. What do you? Oh no, don't listen, Blackula. Oh come oh. on, you know you gotta remember Blackula. You ran Man, over. Blackula. You ran over Blackula. You ran over him in the cab. I was watching it the other night. I was like, she ran over Blackula. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I said to him, and then, man, he, he, he got me. Uh, but it was the makeup that they were using. Me and the, the man that directed that was a black guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was his first movie, too. And uh, when they did the makeup on, it was this makeup, and it was... Kind of greasy, like. Yeah. And I didn't like the grease being on the skin, you know. Yeah. But here we are doing black yellow. And I went out, uh, he said I hit him. You know I didn't hit no director. <laughs> I, I hit no director. And I didn't do that. I know. Well, not the director, not the director. In the movie, in the movie, you had to, you like run over Blackula in the character. When you're driving I ran the cab. Remember, you like hit Blackula with the cab. That, that was the cab. Yeah, yeah, that's and another, I was yeah. just waiting. To, <laughs> I don't know what happened. But he said I almost hit him because I was asking him, what is this? Yes, that they are putting on my skin. I said, I don't want this mess on my skin. Well, he didn't know what they were putting on. <laughs> so he ran out. I said, how dare they run out on me and leave me in here with this mess on me? It was a makeup that, for some reason, it would dry up. Mm-hmm. And then, when the man bit me, <laughs> I became this zombie. Yeah. And I had all of this ugly teeth. But they were saying, oh, yeah. <laughs> you were scary. You were scary. You were supposed to be scary. I hated that movie. But I said, I'm going to play this devil like they never seen before. <laughs> <laughs> man, 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 man. The, the producer I finally met him years and years. I think it was last year I met him, and he come walking up to me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, "What are you apologizing for?" I said, "What did I do?" He said, "You almost knocked me out." <laughs> I said, "Oh no." No, no, no. I said, I do not hit producers. And <laughs> it was just crazy. But he said, I almost hit him. And then, because I didn't know what the makeup was, and he didn't know what the makeup was, but he said, if he ever met me, he was going to apologize. So that's what he was apologizing for. 40 years and later. He didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the makeup was either, and he couldn't explain it to me. What did uh? What did your? Do you remember how your family reacted to uh, when they saw the movie? Did your brothers and sisters see the movie Blackula? My brothers and sisters never saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my brothers and sisters ever looked at that movie because I didn't see that movie. I refused to see that movie because you, I was scared of that movie. You never saw it? it just, when that when that woman I remember them taking me out of this thing and I saw myself I saw this grief started coming alive yeah. in the thing. And then I did that running down the hall, and I said, I'm just going to run down this hall, and I said, I'm going to kill this fucker. <laughs> and I, I don't know what I was doing. I was just following the script, and I said, I'm going to kill this fucker, so here he goes. 
I'm coming out this to myself. Let no. You you got his ass, so you killed him. <laughs> I killed him. I, I just I, I, I had there. He put me in that in that uh it was a it wasn't even death pen, you know. Yeah. They put you in the death pen. And I'm in the death pen and he let me out, I said, I'm gonna kill that sucker. <laughs> <laughs> So the whole movie, I never did see that movie. I don't want to ever see that movie again. I said, I'm through. I'm through with it. All right. All right. And the only time I saw the movie, part of the movie, was when this boy that just loved Black Hiller so much, mm-hmm. and he wanted an interview. And I said, okay. I said, if you like it that well, I said, I'll, I'll talk to you and say what I thought. I said, I've never seen it, you know. <laughs> and uh, he came to my cousin's house, and we talked, and he did it, and he said, I want you to do uh, another interview, but I'm going to have the director and the girl that played the part in that. So he had me at a studio, and that's where I met the director. William Crane? And the director was apologizing Ah. to me that he didn't know what the makeup was either, (laughs) and he couldn't help me. And uh, But that movie was a horror thing almost to me. But <laughs> I was warned that if I did something, I was going to do it to the best of my ability. I mean, I was going to be strong with it. What do you remember about <clears throat> working on Uptown Saturday Night with, uh, you played Bill Cosby's wife in that one, with him and Sidney Poitier yes, and they had a night of trouble. That was the duty. Thing. Now, I don't know how I got that role to play Bill Cosby's wife, but I love Bill Cosby because, now, Sidney Poitier, for some reason, didn't like me because, you know, you can hear how I talk. I talk country. That's he reason. wanted me to talk more proper. Oh. I said, okay, I'll try to talk more proper, and I'm trying to talk Almost like a British accent, and Bill comes <laughs> <laughs> and Bill comes say, "What are you talking like that for?" <laughs> I didn't understand it. I said, "Because that uh, uh, he told me to talk like that." He said, "That is the craziest thing I've ever seen." He said. You don't talk like that. I'm going to talk my natural way, and you're going to talk your natural way, and we are going to do this show. And that's the way we did. Bill Cosby never knocked me out there that I was doing wrong. And that scene is hilarious. When you're in the church together, and he's like hung over from the night before, and he acts like he's going to put the money in. And I'm busy <laughs> trying to punch him and tell him to wish up. Yeah, you're you know. straightening his ass up quick in that scene. You, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm almost punching him in the side. Yeah. <laughs> you know, get yourself together. You're in church. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we played that. It was just, it was a funny thing to me. Now you were on, the pop game was just the dollar. You, uh, you were on the Bill Cosby show in 64, weren't you? Like in earlier days. Not not the Bill, not the Huxtables, but earlier back in the 60s, weren't you? Didn't you make an appearance on that? Yeah, I was, it was early. I was with... Uh, uh, Bill Cosby, but it was during the early days. All right. And uh, I accepted being Bill Cosby's wife. You know, I like being Bill Cosby's wife. 
<laughs> it was fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed playing his wife. Another one that I enjoyed playing the part was with this, what is that? Uh, what was the name of that show? It was this comic. And I loved playing beside him. It was in House Party 3. Oh, Bernie Mac. That's who you're talking about. You were Bernie playing along. Mac. Bernie Mac. And you... I just loved Bernie Mac. Tell me more about that. For some reason. I, 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 don't, I don't know why, but I just loved Bernie Mac. Y'all had a lot of fun together in that scene, though, didn't you? There's even there's photos of you yes. together in your book. Because uh, Bernie Mac was almost like a, 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 a son to me when I saw that part. He was like he was he, he was I, I could play with him. He was just a darling, and I loved acting. With him, for some reason, I don't know why, but he said, when, when I got on his show, it was like he was the comic, but he was also, he says, you're going to be my mother. And I remember him saying, I'm going to do a show, and I want you to be my mother. I said, I would love to be your mother. <laughs> and it was just a serious thing. I just wanted to be with Bernie Mac. And then all of a sudden, I said, oh, Bernie, then forgot old Kenny. <laughs> he had forgotten all about me. And then, Somebody told me he was dead. It was just like uh, my son being dead, you know. Yeah, I remember he passed away in uh, 2000. I never, and I still haven't got, I talk about Bernie Mac, I start almost crying. Oh, That's how, how close I was to Bernie Mac. Now, when you were working on House Party 3 together, you burned your... Your hands cooking that evening after production wrapped, didn't you? And you needed to go to the hospital. Yes, and it still got the, the, the skin. I had to go to the hospital, and they had to take the skin off of my hip, off of my leg, and put it on. Both of my hands was burned, and it was burned bad. I didn't think it was that bad, but they said... It was, and I had to, I was at the hospital, I, in the hospital about a month or two, wow. and uh, they had to cover both hands, and they got the skin off of my leg, my left leg. It still got a big scar on the left leg, where they took all that skin to put on both hands to get it. But oh. that, that's the hard surgery with burn. He, he said, they said, uh, I told him when they came to the house, I didn't know I was burned because I had started cleaning up my kitchen. I was cooking chicken, frying chicken. And my brother Frank Club called my brother Frank and I was close as hell. That was my favorite brother. Anytime he called, we were going to have a good time and talk it. Yeah. I talked so much, I forgot I had the chicken on the stove. And the next thing I know, the smoke was coming out of the house. And I went up there, I knocked. The, the skin of where the grease got all over my hand, and I kicked it outside. I didn't, but the, the fire engines coming. Yeah. Uh. I didn't know it was that bad. All I started was trying to take the water and clean up my kitchen. 
And they said, no, we're going to have to take you to the hospital. Do you know you'll burn? I said, no, and it'll be all right. I'll, I'll make it. I said, they said, no, you ain't. He said, tell us who to call to tell us so we can tell them where we are taking you. I told them, my husband, I told them Frank's number, and then they just took me to the hospital. The hospital up on San Vicente here, and it's the San Vicente Hospital. That's where the actors, they would take actors at that time. But when I got there, the doctor said, Kenny, you were burned real bad, your hands. I really burned. And he says, you're going to have to get somebody. And he said, what I'm going to advise you is to go to a different hospital. This hospital is way too expensive. It cost you a fortune to get your hands straightened out. So my husband had a friend that knew a hospital. It was down by the ocean. And, uh, he had them take me down to that hospital. And uh, that's where they did all the cutting. And then I was there for two, almost, uh, almost a month, a month or something. Had you, can, had you completely wrapped filming at that point? Were you done filming? Or did you have to go back and film more after the surgery? Oh, I did more after the surgery, but it took me a long time to get through the surgery. Yes, I mean, two or three months, it's a long time. With that surgery, and they still have, I still see uh, places where you can tell where it was burned. I still have spots Mm. where on on both hands where... I know where it was put, where the different skin was put. I still have scars on both hands. But once I got it through and once it got well, it took it a long time to get where it wasn't burning and and, and hurting. But when I stopped, I'm a worker. I don't care what happens. I'm going to work if I can. Yeah. But after that happened, I did several shows. And I also did Little House. Yeah, you met Michael Landon on set when he was directing the television movie, It's Good to Be Alive. Yeah, I did. Where I met Michael Landon was on the Rod Capanella story. Mm hmm. And, and he played, you played his mother. Was the, the old f- 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 was a baseball player. One of our baseball players when we started playing baseball. Mm -hmm. And he was killed in a car accident, and they made a movie of his life story. And I played his mother in that life story. That's where I met Michael Landon. And I met him there. It was... he was. You had an epileptic seizure on set, didn't you? During the set, and you kind of gave him specific I did, instructions. Yeah, I had a seizure on the set because it's just like I was talking to Michael, and we were making jokes about everything, and I told him to be careful about everything I do I am epileptic I told him Mm -hmm. and I would might have a seizure and he said what do I do I said if you're not scared you can hold me if you are scared I said just lay me down on the on the couch and let me rest and when I come to, if you ask me my name, and I can tell you my name without stuttering, I said, you know I'm ready to go. If I'm stuttering and stuff like that, I said, you know I'm not. 
And just like that, I went into a seizure. Ah. And those were, when, when I had a seizure, I had grand mal. They were bad seizures. And he did. He held me. When I came to, he said, Eddie, what's your name? And I was stuttering. And so he said, she's not ready. Just let her lay down and we'll do other things. And when she gets ready, when she comes to again, if I ask her my name, her name, and she can tell me she'll be ready. Well, the next time he asked me, I said, oh, Michael, you know I know my name. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like that. You know I know my name. Stop asking me for this question. And that's the way it went on like that. Well, you, like... <laughs> like what Poxy was saying, you would go on to perform on Little House on the Prairie. What do you enjoy most about your time performing on that show? I loved doing Little House on the Prairie because he showed me the scenes. Like, Michael was a great director. He could, he could, when you, when you were doing a scene with Michael, it's like, you has got two cameras there. You don't have to worry about uh, doing a scene and then coming back doing this. Michael was the first director that I had where he would let you do your scene, walk where you wanted to walk, wherever you wanted to walk. He would say, walk where you want to do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, whatever you feel, he said. If I would walk to the chair and 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 stand there at that chair, he would put a little piece of paper down there. She stood at that chair. Then you turn around and you might come on back, whatever you felt like. You did the thing the way you felt it. And he marked every direction you went. And he'd say, are you ready to do it? Are you going to do it that way? I said, that's the way I'm going to do it. And he would have those cameras right on you. You did it that way. And Michael would follow you. What did you just <laughs> have a direct. What did you think when the show came to an end? I know you left before the very end of the show. But... I was hurt, yeah. uh, really, because there was one thing that happened. Now, Michael was good to me, but when the show, when they were getting ready to close that show down, Michael had always had me in a special room because he knew I was epileptic. He knew I might get sick. And I was always in this special room. He had a special room for me. All right. But there was some different directors mm -hmm. had come in and they were talking about black people in show business. We were coming up kind of strong, you know. And these directors had said, and I had heard it, they said, we had better get these black people off of show business or they are going to take over show business like them ball players have taken over. Man. The ball game. That's what they said. Yeah. I heard them say that. I said, uh-oh, we're going to be put off. Then all of a sudden, you start seeing all these black shows going off. You were on a couple of different shows. Well, you made an appearance on Sanford and Son, and you said Red Fox tried to grab your butt, and you had to set his ass straight. Oh, I gave Red Fox a little uh, kick up. Red Fox was kooky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Red Fox, but I wasn't going to let Red Fox 
just be a uh, do what he wanted to to me. I ain't never been that way. I don't let nobody do that to me, and that that's the way I have always been. Well, that's good. You set him straight there, made sure and, you knew what was up. And uh, Red Fox went, and I was on his show, and he went, patting my butt. I told him, let me tell you one thing. I said, what you just touched belonged to me and my husband. And I said, I don't play that is. I said, keep your hand off of my butt. And I said, don't ever do that again. Are we going to have a fight? Are you ready? And I put my fist up. <laughs> you gonna whip, You were going to whip Fred Red Fox's ass. I <laughs> was, it was, it was like, well, me, I have always fought for Maddie. Yeah. My mm-hmm. sister Maddie. My mother always told me, take care of Maddie. Yeah. Maddie was... My baby was not my baby sister. She was a year older than I am. But Maddie was always the one I had to protect. Even in high school, I had to protect Maddie and help Ernestine. Those were the two that I was responsible for. And I knew it. And I did it on the playground with my friend Mary Tennessee and she was trying to teach me how to shoot a, a basketball. Maddie came running and she was crying. No, 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 no. I said, who? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he took me to the park. I didn't understand nothing. I just drew my this bag, and I'm a strong woman. I was a strong girl. Yeah. I put my fence right in his nose. I almost broke his nose. Oh. <laughs> I said, you do not mess with my sister. And at that time, I would fight any boy. It didn't make me no different who he was. I thought my mother told me to take care of Maddie, and I took care of Maddie. She was my baby. She was, I considered her baby sister, but she was not a baby sister. She was my older sister, but I took care of her. Just one of those things. No. And when I was working, I did the work. My sister, Maddie, never had to work because I did the work. It's up. I'm ready. All right. What do you remember <laughs> about What do you remember about working with Carol O'Connor? Because I know you and Carol O'Connor were friends before he was on the Honda family. I know that's my darling. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all were tight, weren't you? Yeah, I love Carol O'Connor. <laughs> But I could never quite, uh, I still have a play that Carol O'Connor and I was going to do when we were young, you know. Yeah, you were going to play a prostitute, that, weren't you? And he was gonna... I was going to play a prostitute. That's what he wrote in it. And... Huh? Wasn't that what he wrote? Am I right in that? I'm, I'm, I'm not... It was one that he wrote. Okay, okay, all right. And the, the, I was going to play the prostitute, and he was going to play the English, the man from England that was a blind man. All right. And that's how we got that going. But before we got to play together, all of a sudden, Carol O'Connor was in that show, that big show. Yeah, all in the family. That was the big one there. All right? in the family. And <laughs> I met the man that produced all in the family. And I said, you done took my friend away from me. That <laughs> 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 was the man that produced all in the family. And I went to uh, an audition. And I said, well, I finally met you. 
I can't stand you. You took my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand this thing. I said, why did I do that? Oh, I'm sure you... <laughs> Yo, you were serious with him. You really got me. <laughs> and you're silly. I don't know why I do such stupid things, you know. Well, but now, it was, I said, I can't stand you. You took my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and I do just silly things. Now, of all, of all your experience in television and movies, which what did you enjoy more? Did you like working in movies more, or did you prefer working in television more? You know, I enjoyed them all, but I enjoyed The Lies of the Fairy. I really did, because I loved the way Michael could just get things done. Not only that, I had the children. I loved children. I loved the children. And I had the children. Then Michael would let me, there's two shows, he, he would write those things, you know. And he would write whatever he wanted to. He write, wrote me two episodes where I had boyfriends. Yeah. Okay. Well, I like that because he was giving me a chance to do different things. I like that. So to do the different, he also would let me sing. There was two shows that we did where I took my church choir and my brother, and we sang on Little House on the Prairie. Oh, that's awesome. How was that experience? How was that experience? That was just great because the people enjoyed it, my choir people, my musicians, they just enjoyed being on Little House on the Prairie. And that was a joy. So I would say I enjoyed Little House more because I had a variety of things. Now, in, in your book, in your book, your new book, and in, in throughout many interviews, you've discussed the will of God and his impact on the outcome of your life. Now, you, your last hey, album, your last, hey, hey, hey. I am. you know, in the last album I'm that, you, and you, that you wrote is called I Saw Love, right? And that's a lot about, uh -huh. a lot about faith and a lot about your faith. Can, what can you tell me about that? When I first, uh, I was raised a Christian. I was baptized a Methodist and I have my family is very deeply religious people to this day. I don't miss going to church on Sunday. Yeah. And I certainly don't miss the first Sunday because that's when we have the last supper. I've read the Bible through uh, twice, and now with my memory not as well as it do, I still read the Bible. But I don't understand it as well as I used to. But you remember things you were taught. So like when I was a child, you had, when you had dinner, when you had any kind of meal, the blessing was always said, and you must say a verse. From the Bible. What's your favorite verse? I always said Jesus wept because I was the baby in my father's house on many mentions. I know in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and it was without form of boy. I can go all the way down through that. I love God's word. Well, I want to ask about your autobiography. What was it like to revisit yeah. and document your life while developing it? There was a long time. There was a long time before I could do my life with Carlo. Mm -hmm. Because, so like today, I have Carlo's picture right here. Yeah. In front of me right now. 
What about your upcoming performance in Hollywood? About your new one that you've got coming up? You, you've got rehearsals for that this week coming up, don't you? How are you getting ready for that? Well, I'm not really... I, I, I'm concerned about it because they want me to sing. Mm-hmm. By me being an old woman and epileptic, I am still an epileptic. I am the person that has the old folks tremor. That's the Catherine Hepburn shake. That is a form of cerebral palsy, but it does not work at the shaking of the hands like cerebral palsy. It works in the brain and in the vocal cords and stuff like that. Okay. Well, how do you deal? How that, do you deal with that? that getting a, that, you, that troubles me. But I do have medication that I take for that, and it's only up to God. Whatever God gives me, I will do. If it's not His will that it comes up, come out right, that I accept His will. Whatever. Is the will of God. I accept His will, not my will, but Thy will be done. All right. Well. So, if He wants me to sing, He will make a way somehow out of no way. What's your favorite song you to sing? Are you if what what if of all the songs you're gonna have to sing? What's your favorite song gonna be to sing? Well, my favorite is naturally Love Letters because Love Letters is the song that made me famous. If the man had pushed the right song, the one that was going to be the hit because it made it to 32 in Boston, was she never heard of anyone called Jesus? You never listened to that one, did you? Oh no, 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 no! I've listened to it. Yes, I I've, have. I've actually been listening to that you. was the song that Boston loved. That was the big one, and it became it went all the way up to thirty-two. If the man had to push the right song, that song. Could have been my third hit. Well, what happened with that? Why didn't they push that one? Had the wrong man, and he was pushing one day at a time. Oh, okay. So they and were just one pushing. day at a time. It been a hit twice. It didn't need to be a third hit. Mm. But the one that Boston was playing. Wish you never heard of anyone called Jesus. If they had a push that one, that would have been the hit. All right. Well, Miss Kitty Lesser, I believe we will let you go as we are, <laughs> we are running short on time here on the Ghost of Hollywood, but we have had a wonderful time speaking with you, and we wish you the best. Well, it's of been my pleasure being with you. I know, thank you so much for spending time. I'm sorry earlier about today, things getting mixed up with all the, you know, the technology and oh, stuff. Oh, that's all right. We all have our ups and downs. That is true, but this this has been, been <laughs> quite quite a unique experience. You've lived an incredible life, and you have had an incredible career. And, you know, and, and it's and you've done so many different things, like you said, and you've also you've been there's so much we didn't get to discuss as well. I mean, the extent, you know, you've been a mother, you know, you're a grandmother. Um, you have definitely you, you still take care of a lot of your family to this day. So I know that you've yeah. uh, you're a very, very strong woman. And uh, you are you are definitely, I would believe, an essential part of American culture. And yeah. I think that is important. And I'm glad to have met you and to have been able to spoke with you, speak with you. Thank you so much. And may God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and keep you peace. And God bless you, Katie Lester. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Can't get enough of the Ghost of Hollywood? Check out our entire first season, now streaming wherever you choose to listen to your podcast. And don't forget to like and subscribe. 
While you're at it, check out our website at theghostofhollywood.com so that we can keep you up to date on all the latest with The Ghost of Hollywood. Welcome back to The Ghost of Hollywood. I'm Miss Reagan here with Poxy Leonard, and the time has come to wrap up tonight's episode here in the studio. And with the end of our 20th episode marks the completion of our second season. So, while we are excited to take a much-anticipated break here at Ghost of Hollywood, we will be back in November to begin our third season. Again, a big thanks to Miss Ketty Lester and her manager, David Avara, for their time and effort collaborating with us to get this episode put together. Miss Lester's book can be found at her website at misskettylester.com. We'd also like to thank our crew here for all of their hard work this season, compiling research, writing, composing, and engineering each episode so that we can bring you the best possible program on cinematic history in all its facets. And that'll conclude Season 2 of The Ghost of Hollywood. For more information, please visit us at theghostofhollywood.com, where you can sign up for our monthly newsletter to keep up with all the latest concerning the show. And there you have it, wall crawlers. I'm Poxy Leonard here with Miss Reagan, saying so long until this fall. Until next time, everybody. Good morning and good night. You've been listening to another episode of The Ghost of Hollywood. The Ghost of Hollywood is directed by Zach Flannery. The show is authored by Chris Klon and Zach Flannery. Composition samples and score by Jesse Garcia in Pineapple Nightmare. Production management by Mary Flannery at the Electric Garden Company. And mastering by Grady Sizemore in Microphonic Meltdown in Portland, Oregon. For more information on The Ghost of Hollywood, please visit theghostofhollywood.com. Dot com.